The John Lewis Voting Rights Act has just passed the House of Representatives and is now up for a vote in the Senate. Now, What fascinates me about this particular piece of legislation is that it's all about the meandering debates that I've had some nights at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. The Supreme Court doesn't have the final say on laws. If they rule, uh, Congress actually meant this when they passed the bill, well, Congress can turn around and say, hey, no we didn't, that's not at all what we meant, and pass a law clarifying their position. Now that's precisely what the John Lewis Voting Rights Act does. Today my goal is twofold. First I'm going to explain the Supreme Court decisions that the John Lewis Voting Rights Act aims to clarify, and then second I'm going to explain how it clarifies Congress's position. Now this bill clarifies Congress's position on two recent Supreme Court cases that rolled back the 1965 Voting Rights Act the 2013 case of Shelby County v Holder and the 2021 case of Brnovich v Democratic National Committee. So first, the infamous Shelby County v Holder case. In 1961, Congress looked at a map of America and said, oh boy, some states are really trying to block minorities from voting. That's going to be a bit of a problem. If those states want to change their voting laws, they first have to send drafts of those voting laws to the Department of Justice for pre-clearance. So far, no controversy. In this 2013 case, the court did not invalidate the actual pre-clearance provision of the statute. Now here's where things get tricky. How do you determine which states have to predetermine their election laws? Now this method employed in the 1965 Voting Rights Act made a whole lot of sense in 1965. Unfortunately, over the years it started to age like fine milk. The basic idea was, back in 1965, we're going to run a whole bunch of census data for who is and isn't voting, combine that with an analysis of where repressive voting laws are in place, like literacy laws, and finally use all of those statistics to identify states that are trying to block the vote. Makes a whole lot of sense, right? Now this preclearance was set to expire 5 years later. Of course, Congress being Congress, they blindly extended that preclearance restriction 5 years after 5 years. Now, unfortunately, the way the law was written, the data could not be updated along with those extensions. So now we're in 2013 using data from 1965 to identify which states in the modern day were blocking the vote. A little less impressive, but is it unconstitutional? The real question facing the court in this case was, is it constitutional to use over 50 year old data to identify which states are currently trying to block the vote? Now, In the end, the majority reasoned that the disparate treatment of these states was based on 40 year old facts having no logical relationship to the present day, and that a state cannot be subject to preclearance because of past discrimination. So ok, the preclearance itself we're fine with. But the test, that's super out of date. What's the remedy here? Well, it's really simple. Congress, give us a test that's not based on 50 year old statistics. Heck, you could just change the law so you can update the data in this spreadsheet. It's not rocket science. Unfortunately, none of the jurisdictions have to comply with pre clearance unless and until Congress can enact a new formula to determine whom it covers. So, did Congress update the equation at any point between 2013 and 2021? No. Oh, come on, really? Now, because of that, the preclearance section of the 1965 Voting Rights Act has not been in effect for the past eight years. The John Lewis Voting Rights Act addresses this court case by uh, creating a new test to determine which states require preclearance. Pretty simple. It took Congress long enough. Now, the John Lewis Act imposes preclearance on states where 15 or more voting rights violations occurred in the previous 25 years, or that committed 10 such violations if at least one of those was committed by the state itself. Basically, you can whoopsie daisy yourself into 14 voting rights violations before you have to start showing the class your work. We're not really reinventing the wheel with this one. 
Now, the trailing 25-year dates on this test would allow it to stay relevant with whatever the current situations are in different states, and therefore it would address the Supreme Court's stated concern in this case. Now to the other case this bill addresses, Brnovich v. Democratic National Committee. Now this was a case where the courts really got to flex their improv skills. It was an incredibly open-ended question, and who oh boy did they get an incredibly open-ended decision. You see, the problem was that Arizona had approved two voting laws that could potentially pass a legal threshold to be considered racially discriminatory and therefore shot down by the courts. Problem is, the 1965 Voting Rights Act had been incredibly broad with its language to describe what constitutes a law that should be taken down by the courts. To quote the act that the court was interpreting, a violation is established if, based on the totality of circumstances, it is shown that the political process leading to elections are not equally open to participation by members of a given race. The question facing the court today was, what did Congress mean when they wrote the phrase, totality of the circumstances? As you can imagine, conservatives were up into a much wider totality of circumstances. Well, let's hear out a few more people before we determine whether this is discriminatory. Hold on, have you considered all the people blocking those votes helps? While progressives took a very literal interpretation to those totality of circumstances. Alright, let's ignore everything else. If, given the totality of circumstances, a law prevents one more minority voter from casting their vote than a white person, well, that's a voting law that violates the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this case very much did not get a definitive answer. No tests were given, and there's very little meat on this judicial bone. Instead, the decision reads a bit more like Neil Gorsuch panicking into a camera and saying, oh, here are some things that you should consider when evaluating these laws. Just noodle over these five factors of it and then follow your heart. Don't let me tell you how to do your job. It's what Congress would have wanted. Now, some of these considerations he included in this list were a bit on the, wait, what? side of the spectrum. Now first, the size of the burden imposed by a challenged voting rule. If your voting law leads to slight disproportionate impact on minorities, but that impact can pretty easily be overcome, well, maybe that's not a problem? Again, not telling you what to think, not saying it's not a problem, just something that the judges should consider. Now this applies to things that would make voting more inconvenient for certain groups, but not insurmountably so. Take for example, we're shutting down a polling location or we're throwing out ballots that have mistakes in them. Second, and this second consideration is a bit odder, but you should consider the degree to which a voting rule departs from what was standard practice when the section was last amended in 1982. Alright, let's hold these discriminatory laws to the standards of what would fly in the early 1980s. If Congress was fine with it when they enacted the amended law, well, they shouldn't have fresh objections now. This part of the decision took an even stranger right-hand turn when Gorsuch went out of his way to tack on a part about mail-in voting. He wrote, Therefore, it is relevant that in 1982, states typically required nearly all voters to cast their ballots in person on election day, and allowed only narrow and tightly defined categories of voters to cast absentee ballots. So if a state were to cut their ballots in a way that disproportionately fall on minorities, well, Neil Gorsuch wants the court to consider that little snapple cap fact before rendering an opinion. Now third, noodle over the size of any disparities any rules impact on member of different racial or ethnic groups. Alright, so if a rule that you're implementing prevents slightly more minorities from voting, again not saying it's good, but maybe you'll let it slide. Hint of suppression for the aging democracy that wants to look like it did in the good old days. Next, the court must consider opportunities provided by a state's entire system of voting when assessing the burden imposed by a challenge provision. 
All right, so you put in some restrictions that disproportionately follow minorities. Well, what if elsewhere you have some systems in place to relieve that burden? For example, if you ban mail-in ballots, but then you turn around and provide a robust busing option or secure rural ballot collections. Might be something for the court to consider. And finally, the strength of the state interest served by a challenged voting rule is also an important fact that must be taken into account. All right, finally, you got yourself a voting law that is going to disproportionately prevent minorities from voting. Uh, why? Now, Gorsuch, in this decision, explained that a state's interest in implementing the law should fall under the totality of circumstances that we're trying to establish to be considered in judgment. Now, the reason Arizona specifically gave for implementing this potentially discriminatory law was fighting voter fraud, a compelling state interest that the majority in the court found acceptable. Now, with this decision, Gorsuch crafted this for your consideration list that I just went over and said that this should be in the background of every judge's mind when they try to evaluate a potentially discriminatory law under Congress's totality of circumstances. What the John Lewis Voting Rights Act does is say, well, if you wanted to know what Congress meant when they wrote totality of circumstances, you could have just asked us. Hey, I got your decision right here, and wow, is it interesting. I also got a sharpie right here, and let me help clarify a few things. Now, this bill would forbid courts from considering certain factors in Voting Rights Act cases, such as whether a particular voting restriction has a long pedigree or was in widespread use at some earlier date. That's addressing that whole 1980s tangent that I mentioned earlier. Also, whether the law is defended as an effort to fight fraud would not be allowed to be reviewed by the court, and whether the state makes other methods of voting available. Can't think about those three things when evaluating a potentially discriminatory voting law. Now, similarly, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act looks at this decision and says, hey, while I'm holding your list right here, let me add a few things to this. The bill also contains a list of factors that the courts should consider when hearing Voting Rights Act cases, including the history of official voting-related discrimination in the state or political subdivision. Basically, is this a part of a trend or just a one-off discriminatory whoopsie-daisy? The degree to which voting is racially polarized in a jurisdiction, such as if white voters overwhelmingly prefer Republicans and black voters overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. You're blocking Democratic votes when you racially discriminate? Oh, that's certainly not going to help your case. And finally, the extent to which minority group members bear the effects of discrimination in areas such as education, employment, and health. Now basically, if there's a program or implemented law that discriminates against people who work, say, odd hours, and most of the people who work odd hours are minorities, well, write that down and consider it when you're rendering your final decision on whether that law is discriminatory. So there you have it, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act versus the John Roberts Voting Rights Decisions. Will Congress have the votes to um actually the Supreme Court and express what they meant? Or will the decisions stand the way they currently exist? Until next time, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.